Today we begin our first part of our sermon series entitled God Spoke a Word Respecting Other Faiths. And we're going to be talking about acknowledging some of our biases. There are handouts in your bulletins for those that are observing online. These are also downloadable at therevolutionchurch.com. We invite you to partake of those and read and follow along. Now, in our sermon for today, there's an awful lot of information that we'll just not recover. It may seem a little bit daunting. There are six pages here. And you're going to say, oh my gosh, we're going to be here until, what, 2 o'clock today. That is not going to happen. I'm going to get through as relatively as quickly as possible. What I am going to trust you to do is be able to go home, look at some of the information that we do not review, and think about this yourself. One of the things that we do encourage you to do at the Revolution Church is to think for yourself what it is God is trying to speak to you. Weigh it against the scriptures. Weigh it against what other people have to say. Weigh it against those things that you learn and observe through nature, creation, through your relationships with other people. Because I ask that you do not just accept everything I have to say at face value. It is all about, about, about you walking in faith, walking in your relationship with God, and going the way that you are called in life. And so what, let's take a look at our introduction today. We all have biases that inform our worldview. And it's important that we acknowledge them so they not become a stumbling block in our interaction with other, others. And so that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to outline for you some of my biases as a Christian believer in God so that they not become a stumbling block as we look at other faiths. So let's look at the very first one. I believe that there is a God. Now this seems like an evident thing. We're sitting here gathered together for a worship service today. You think, well, everybody in church believes that there is a God. That is not necessarily true. There is actually a man named Samir Samanovich, who is an atheist, by the way, who yearns to believe that there is a God, but he cannot believe that there is a God, but he goes to church every single Sunday. And you say, well, why would an atheist go to church every Sunday? Because he believes that religion and faith in particular and in particular Christianity and faith and those faiths that are oriented towards those Christian beliefs have done a fantastic job of expressing our relationship with God in a way that makes a difference in the world and of passing those things of faith on to our children and those things that are important and those values that are important to our children onto them so they might interact with the world in a manner that is positive and constructive. And so he goes to church every Sunday despite the fact that he doesn't believe that there is a God. So you cannot assume just because people are gathered in a church that they believe everything the same, in the same way that you do. So first of all, I will say that I do believe that there is a God. But I'm going to say something that might cause people to question me. I don't know that there is a God. Now you're saying, well, wait a minute, you're a pastor. I don't know that there is a God, and you can't prove that there is one. Now, you can point to some things. You can point to creation, a lot of things that we're going to talk about. You can point to some miraculous type events. Almost every single one of them, a humanist or a secularist, will be able to find a way to explain those things away in secular terms. Well, it's just a psychological thing. It was just a physical thing. There's no such thing as a miracle, whatever the case might be. We cannot prove that there is a God. If we could prove there was a God, everybody in this world would be a Christian, or everybody in this world would be a person of faith. They are not. So what I'm here to tell you is, I can't prove it. I don't know that there is one. In fact, I'm what you would call a doubting believer. I have times of severe doubt in my life. Maybe you've heard stories after Mother Teresa died. Uh, she actually had um, a diary in which she kept record of the fact that she, on many days of her life, in fact, for about a 50-year dry spell, wondered if there was actually a God. I mean, imagine serving the people of Calcutta, the people who are dying of starvation and suffering, and, uh, and wondering whether or not there's a God because you're surrounded so much by so much pain and suffering. And she said she went through a severe drought of faith for a very long extended period of time. I've had very severe long droughts and periods of time in my life that were very dry where I wondered whether or not there was a God. I said, God, I don't even wonder if you exist after everything go that's going on. I'm not sure I can believe in you. And I'm sure God looked down and said, I'm not sure I can believe in you either, but I'm still here for you. And I guess that was the point in my life where I said, okay, I might doubt, but I'm still here. And God brings you through those seasons of doubt, but I still doubt. Doubt is a sign of rationality, not a lack of faith. I don't think you would be rational if you didn't at some point in your life doubt that God exists or in the goodness and the graciousness of God. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my belief. My belief is based upon a number of factors, not limited to the following. The influence of friends, family, my culture, 
I embrace that. There's some people that use that as a criticism. Well, you just believe because your family believed. Well, I do believe because my family believed. That's true. That is a major influence in my life, and I'm not going to doubt that. I'm going to embrace that. Also, the scientific knowledge that we have available to us today does not in any way preclude the plausibility of God. That's important to acknowledge. The philosophical framework of the Bible still accurately reflects the human condition. What amazes me that a book written 3,000 years ago, in some cases, three to 4,000 years ago for some of the oldest texts, some of the oldest stories that are recognized in the Bible and so forth, still reflect the condition that exists in this world, the way humans interact with each other. I find that amazing that in essence humans have not changed that much in 4,000 years. We might have better technology, but we're not necessarily any more moral. We certainly struggle with the same things that our forebears struggled with 4,000 years ago. Nothing has changed. As much as we secular human beings like to think they have, they have not. The human need to be rooted into a shared tapestry and story is another reason why I believe in God. And lastly, but not limited to this, there are many other reasons. My pers the personal experiences and those communal transcendent experiences that I interpret as the activity of God. I've seen a person who had cancer, who was healed of that cancer. A secularist might say, well, that's just nature and the crazy things that happen. I interpret it as the handiwork of God. Call me crazy. I don't care. But there's some things that I think are evidence that God is is working amongst us and may be interpreted in different ways, I interpret those things as the fact that God is still active in miraculous ways in this world. So I believe that there is a God. The second thing, my second assumption, and my second bias is that I have faith in God. Now everybody says, well, wait a minute, belief and faith, those are the same things. No, they're not. Maybe you believe that Elvis is still living, but I guarantee you, you're not changing your life because you believe that Elvis is still living. Belief and faith are two different things. Belief is one thing. It's one thing to believe that something occurs, to believe that there is a God. It's another thing to say, I'm going to change my life because I believe that this thing exists. So faith is where you take that belief and transform your life in some way to reflect that. Your activity of your life is changed by the thing that, in which you believe. So faith is a belief that is put into action. Now, since I accept that there is a God and I believe that there is a God... I accept that this God that created the universe and all that exists must be a pretty formidable force. Take a look at the universe and how huge it is. This God must be a formidable force and one with which we must reckon as humans. So therefore, the presence of God has an implication for life. How do I act? How do I behave amongst others? I therefore try to live my life in a manner that's reflective of my belief in God, and that is what's called faith. Okay? I will tell you that there are things in my life that, it's not that if I didn't believe that there was a God, I wouldn't just all of a sudden fall, my life wouldn't fall into chaos, I wouldn't become an immoral person. I would still, to the best of my ability, try to act in a moral fashion because I think it's the best way for humanity. However, I would also tell you that there are certain things in my life, in addition to not being here today, but other things, there are other things that I just wouldn't give. There are other ways in my life. And, and, and uh, Samir Samanovich, I mentioned him earlier today, he's one of the atheists who had studied religion, and actually with the uh, perspective of he wanted to prove that religion was a destructive force in the world, he ended up coming to a totally opposite perspective. As he studied religion and faith in the world, he realized that people who have religion, people who have faith, actually give twice as much, actually three and a half times as much, as those who do not have a faith and God, who are consider themselves non-religious and atheists. Three and a half times. So we give of our resources at three and a half times the rate. We volunteer twice as much as those who are non-religious and atheists. And so he said, this is an amazing thing, that people who are inspired by faith, obviously it inspires them to give more generously. Now I would tell you, if I didn't believe that it was God, I probably wouldn't give as generously as I do. I'd still give, but I wouldn't give as much. Chances are you wouldn't either, statistically. So my belief in God, I put into practice in faith, and I change my lifestyle to reflect that. So I believe that there is a God. I have faith in God. The third thing, I am a Christian. Now, there are some people, I will tell you, I've already 
told Terry, who's our tech guy here in the church uh, this morning, I've, I've received a few emails related to this sermon series from Christians who've been affiliated with our church at one time or another who said, oh, I just can't get into this. This is just wrong, and I think you're going down the wrong path. I can't believe you're talking about respecting other faiths. And I think it's because they probably think I'm a universalist. I'm a Christian. I'm very clearly in the Christian camp. And we Christians have a unique perspective on God. Okay? Our belief is that God has been revealed to us through Jesus Christ to be a God of relationships and a God of healing. Jesus Christ is God's healing message and love story. Okay? Jesus Christ is God's healing message and love story and is God's gift to the world. So I do believe that we Christians have a unique perspective that I think the world needs to hear. But that doesn't mean that I disrespect other faiths just because I think God has been revealed through Jesus. Take a look at my next one. I believe that we Christians have a purpose, therefore, in life. Our purpose is to announce the good news of God's love and healing in this world, and we're called to love others and to care for God's creation. You know, in the book of Genesis, it talks about that great story of creation, how God put his image inside of each one of us and called us to do three things, to love God, to love each other, and care for God's creation. It's pretty darn simple, honestly. That's all God asks us to do. We have pretty much done everything we humanly possibly can do to screw that all up and mess it up. Am I right? We've destroyed our relationship with God, with each other, and with God's creation. You don't have to look for it far to see the evidence of that. And who Jesus is, Jesus is God's word that he has come to reconcile our relationship with him and with each other and with God's creation. That, in 30 seconds, is the message of Christianity. Outside of that, I believe that every other faith has something that they can teach us. But that's what we Christians have that is unique that we can share with other people. All right, go on to that next page. Next thing, there is only one law, and that is the law of love. Love cannot be instituted, regulated, or legislated. Let me say that again. Love cannot be instituted, regulated, or legislated. As soon as you take a pen and a piece of paper and say, we are going to create a Christian country, and you put any other law on that piece of paper except love, it ceases to be Christian. That is why the United States of America never was, is not now, and never will be a Christian nation unless we take all of those laws on the books of the United States and pitch them and get rid of them and just put one law, love. If we have any other law other than love, it is not a Christian country. Simple as that. And love cannot be instituted, regulated, or legislated. It is a free gift of God, and it is up to us to love in the best way that we possibly can, inspired by what God has done for us. My next bias, the only people Jesus ever condemned in his life on earth were religious leaders. Don't believe it? Go and look in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and read every story of condemnation of Jesus. It is always directed at religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the people that would lead the people astray. So if Jesus Christ were physically present with us and walking on this earth and preaching this morning in this congregation or somewhere out in the street, I'm going to tell you who he would condemn. He would condemn us Christians who place schismatic stumbling blocks in front of those who seek God. Because here's what we Christians do. You see, we, we take uh, these, you know, all these stumbling blocks and we put them in front of people and say, we want you to have a relationship with God, but you know what? First, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. Oh, if you get through, through these, then you can be in a relationship with God. What the heck type of loving message is that? You know what God does? This is what Jesus does. He gets... He gets rid of these stupid things. He says, just come to me. Get all these stumbling blocks out of the way. We Christians are builders of stumbling blocks. We've got to get rid of those stumbling blocks and invite people to relationship with Christ. Us Christians who place schismatic stumbling blocks in front of those who seek God are the ones whom God, Jesus Christ is really ticked off with. Because that's who he's ticked off with in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The other people who Jesus would be ticked off with is religious leaders. And, I'm, and I say this in general. Religious leaders, Christian religious leaders, Muslim religious leaders, Buddhist religious leaders, 
Hindu religious leaders, pagan religious leaders, leaders of every single denomination and every single religion in the face of the planet, I think God is going to be really ticked off with. Because any time that we take this special knowledge that we supposedly have as religious leaders and use it to control or limit access to God, we are in the wrong, regardless of what religion we seem to represent. Now, I want to caution you with this, because again, this is where a lot of the people in the, in the mail that I've been getting, the emails of those who are opposing me trying to preach this sermon series are hitting and hammering me on, they think I'm somehow the universalist. I am not a universalist. Okay? I am not a universalist. I'm going to tell you outright, there is not a place in the kingdom of heaven for everybody. You say, ooh, well, who's going to be left out? Well, I'm afraid that the people who are going to have the hardest time getting into the kingdom of heaven are Christians. And I'm a Christian. You want to know why? Because Christians are going to get to heaven and they're going to say, well, God, you can't let that... Well, that, didn't I just see a Buddhist go by? How can you let that Buddhist get into the kingdom of heaven? Because he loved me. Well, he didn't know Jesus. Well, maybe he didn't know Jesus because you put a stumbling block in front of him that prevented him from knowing Jesus. So maybe the person who's responsible for that is you, not him. Well, there's an atheist. How could that atheist get in before me? He doesn't even believe that you exist because you put a stumbling block in front of his way. Because he saw the hypocrisy of you Christians and said, I'm not going to believe that. Do you think God is going to hold him accountable for our faults? I don't think so. I'm just saying. The next bias I have. God is working to bring all of creation into relationship with him. All of creation. It says that on many occasions, Book of Romans, many other places in the Bible, even in the, and, and, and the Psalms and so forth. God wants all people to come into relationship with God, the gift of love uh, that we have the privilege of sharing. And so God is good, God is kind, God is gracious, God is loving. And as evangelists, as people who are Christians, our evangelism is all about being truth tellers and hope givers to the world. Truth tellers and hope givers to the world. Our job as Christians is to hold up a mirror to people and say, you are the image of God. And when I'm saying that you are the image of God, I mean every single person sitting here, every single person who's watching this on the internet, every single person, whether they're Buddhist or Muslim or atheist or Jew or Hindu, has inside of themselves the image of God. Our job as Christians is to hold up a mirror to them and say, look deeply into that mirror and see how beautiful God has made you. That is our job. You are the image of God. We are to tell people that God wants a relationship with them, with everyone. That is the simple message of Christianity that I think we have really messed up. So evangelism is about putting people into line with our schismatic theology and traditions, but putting them into relationship with Christ, or better yet, bringing Christ to them. Not bringing them to Christ, bringing Christ to them, and then getting out of the way and letting the Holy Spirit move in their lives as God sees fit. My next bias. We Christians do not have a corner on the God market. Now, there's a very classical way of looking at Christian theology that there are four different manners in which God has been revealed, and I'm going to go over those in just a minute, but let me get to this first of all. I believe that non-Christians can have valuable insights into the nature of God, and that just because a person is a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever doesn't mean that they're Satan-inspired. I know there's a lot of Christians, I'll probably get a lot more hate mail about this, but I'm telling you, just because a person is a pagan or a Hindu or a Muslim or a Buddhist does not make them Satan-inspired. I think that we've got to get rid of that concept and rid of that thinking in our church. God is always faithful, the Bible says, to reveal himself to people in every country, every tribe, every place in the world. And there's so much we could learn from other people if we just listen to them. Now let me tell you the four classical views and theology, of Christian theology, of how God has revealed himself to all of creation. And I'm going to tell you, Two of them are not uniquely Christian. In fact, it very clearly says in the Bible that God reveals himself to all people in this manner without Jesus Christ. So let's start with the very first one. God is revealed in creation. 
Look at Psalm 1, 19, 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the works of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Did you hear that? Do you know who wrote this? It was a Jew. He was writing in Hebrew. He was saying, you know, the Chinese, the Asians, the Africans, all those different tribes and peoples and all those different languages, God is speaking to them as well in creation. In their language, in their way, in a powerful, mighty way, God is noisy and, 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 and vociferous in his language. He's, he's constantly trying to share with the world how much he loves them through creation and it is evident in creation. Not just specific to the Jews. So I believe that there are people through taking a look at the stars, taking a look at through creation, taking a look at relationships we have with one another, I'm going to have some insights about who God is that maybe we Christians don't get. Maybe we could learn from them if we just listen to them. The second thing that we're told in the Bible, God is revealed to us, or God is revealed in our conscience. Take a look at Romans chapter 2. Paul says, when Gentiles do not have the law, do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So what's he saying? Paul is recognizing the fact that there are many people who don't know who Jesus is. But God has written into their hearts, into their, the conscience of God. That's why an atheist can be a moral person. That's why a Hindu can be moral. That's why a Buddhist can be moral. Why? Because God has placed inside of them the same type of conscience that has been placed inside of us. That's why somebody else, even if they're not Christian, can have an insight into who God is and into morality and actually call us to account for the our immorality. Because I'm hating to tell you, we Christians sometimes need to be called into account for the immorality that we have wrecked upon this world. So I have no disrespect for those people of other faiths and even atheists coming up and saying, you guys need to be held accountable because you are not moral. Well, they've got an insight into God that maybe we didn't have, that we need to be aware of that maybe they, we need to understand because they, they are bringing to us something that we just aren't, are ignorant of. All right, next page. So God is revealed how? God is revealed through creation. God is revealed through our conscience. Those two things are, are things that can be revealed to people whether they're Christian or not. God is revealed, we believe, as Christians in Jesus. Now we say, well, that person doesn't believe in Jesus. Well, maybe that person doesn't believe in Jesus because of us Christians. We've been the, been the stumbling block. I'm convinced that the majority of people who have rejected Jesus haven't really rejected Jesus. They've rejected you. They've rejected me. And they've rejected how we've told the message of Christ. And as I love, maybe you've seen this quote before from Hatma Gandhi, famous Hindu leader who I think was definitely a messenger of God. He said this, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So God is revealed in creation, God is revealed in our consciences, God is revealed in Jesus, and lastly, in our classical form of theology, God is revealed in the Bible. Now if we take a look at the Bible, what is the Bible? The Bible, we believe, is the Word of God. It is normative for our faith. Yes, that's the next phrase you've got to fill in in your nice little open spot there, normative. If you don't know what the word normative, normative is N-O-R-M-A-T-I-V. Look it up in your dictionaries when you get home. But basically normative means that it's, it's uh, appropriate for living our lives by and operating our, our viewpoints. It, it, it tells us what God wants us to know about who He is. It's normative for life. It's, it's uh, it's, uh, it provides for us the information that we need to know and how we need to live our lives as Christian people. Now that said, you've got to understand how the Bible came into being. It's not like people got up one day and said, oh, I'm going to write the Bible. Nobody got up one day and said, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to write a Bible that's going to tell us all about God. What they did is they said, I'm going to write something that's going to be valuable to about what I've learned about God without any intention that it's going to be passed on for generations after that. 
But what happened is we started collecting some of these books, and we said, you know, these are valuable. They tell us some important insights into who God is. We collected these books into what we now call the 66 books, or the canon of the Bible, and we passed them on for generations to come. But this process took thousands of years. Okay? So the Bible has been tested over thousands of years before it got passed on to us. The Bible is not a legalistic document of rules to live by. It is a story. It's God's story of how God wants to interact with humanity. But does that mean that God doesn't interact with humanity outside of the boundaries of the Bible? I think God has been busy in many different places outside of the boundaries of the Bible. And so... Yes, God speaks to us through the Bible. That doesn't mean that God can't speak to us in other places. So are there other ways through which God can communicate to us? Through science, through music, through other people, through sports. All of these things are very important in which God can communicate to us. There's a lot, uh, one more thing that I would like to share with you about how I believe that God communicates to us and what I believe that we need to recognize as biases about our faith. I believe that the world is a much better place because of people of faith. And this is, of course, totally in contradiction to what Christopher Hitchens and uh, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris say. They think that Christianity and religion in general has wrought, wrought a tremendous amount of destruction. I'm not going to deny the fact that religion and faith and people of faith have done some terrible things in the name of God. But I think overall, I disagree with their conclusions. I think this world would be a much worse place and a much worse situation were it not for people of faith. There's a lot of information that you can share where I kind of uh, break out some of the myths, or I should say fables, of the atheists and, and some of their uh, poor history and views on history and how they're absolutely wrong about the influence of faith and Christianity and religion in this world. But I want you to go to the last page. We're going to go through this as quickly as we can. Because I believe, again, the people of faith have made a tremendous difference in this world. And I'm going to tell you what contributions I think people of faith have made. I think people are more generous when they are people of faith. They give more of their time and their, their money to charity. Take a look at this. I'll go through this quick. Christians are 38% more likely to give than non-religious to charity. Religious people donate three and a half times more money when they do give compared to a non-religious person, an atheist. Christians are 32% more likely to volunteer their time, and when they do give their time, they give twice as often as non-religious people in the, every year. 88% of those who devote themselves to spiritual life give and volunteer their time, while only 46% of those who are non-religious and atheists give and volunteer their time. And while the majority of money that Christians give, uh, it's given to religious institutions, they still outgive non-religious people by 14%. All of this has as its source Samir Samanovich, an atheist, not a Christian, an atheist, who was studying religion and found that it makes a tremendous difference in this world and is a positive influence for good in the world. Look at number two. People of faith created the scientific method out of the discovery that the world and the universe is ordered, therefore it can be known. And the irony is, is that secular humanism owes its very existence to people of faith without whom the method of scientific discovery would not have been invented. And lastly, people of faith created numerous institutions from which we as society benefit, including secular forms of government built upon individual freedom, education for the masses, university education, social systems to assist the poor, the creation of hospitals, the ab abolition of slavery, equality amongst men and women, and the civil rights movement. None of these things would have happened without people of faith who are the primary movers and shakers to make these things happen. So I'm looking forward to this journey in the weeks to come as we study the difference that faith makes in people's lives and what we can learn from other people. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, we do give you thanks that you blessed us so richly with your love. We thank you for faith that rings out throughout the world. Even those who are not Christians, oh God, have insights into who you are, have made a tremendous difference and an amazing impact on this world for good. And we ask, oh God, that you would bless us and let us continue to, to use our muscle, especially the muscle of our brain, uh, that we might think about uh, how we can continue to improve this world and be a blessing in Jesus' name.